Part One of the First Number of Art in Australia, 1916. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction The principal aim of Art in Australia is to make the work of Australian artists better known to the Australian public. The Commonwealth is large, and its population is small. The cities are far apart, and the doings of artists in one place are little known beyond it. Faithful reproductions of their work in a publication of this kind will give a good idea of their quality to people who have no time or opportunity of seeing the originals. Art in Australia hopes, therefore, to bring the artists into closer association with one another, and with the picture-buying public. It also hopes to enlarge the number of those interested in the artistic productions of Australia. Many people who can afford to have good pictures in their homes need only to be made acquainted with the fine quality of some of the local work in order to become purchasers of it instead of imported pictures. Australia has already contributed a number of artists of distinction to the world and is developing an art of enduring value. The best cannot be done by artists here, however, until the public interested in Australian art is much larger than it is. A publication of this kind cannot, of course, be a complete survey of artwork in Australia. Each number will be no more than a contribution to that end. No attempt will be made to treat each artist's work comprehensively, and the artists represented in this number may be represented by other phases of their art in later numbers. The scope of art in Australia will be enlarged as occasion demands it. Certain difficulties which could not be overcome made it necessary for the editors to include a disproportionate number of pictures from New South Wales in the first number. The balance in favour of the other states will be adjusted in time. It is intended to publish art in Australia half yearly. Readers who wish to obtain it regularly should order it from their booksellers or from the distributing agents, Messrs Tyrrells Limited, 99 Castlereagh Street, Sydney. All other communications should be addressed to the editors, 24 Bond Street, Sydney. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 2 of the First Number of Art in Australia, 1916 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. William Beckwith McInnes by R. Sutherland Illustrated by The Plough Oil painting in the possession of Sir W. Baldwin Spencer, Melbourne Among the younger generation of Victorian landscape painters, the work of none stands out as possessing in so marked a degree the qualities of initiative and independence, as does that of William Beckwith McInnes. Born just twenty-seven years ago, the son of Malcolm McInnes of East Malvern, young McInnes, at the age of fourteen and a half, entered as a student at the Melbourne National Gallery, where first under Frederick McCubbin, and afterwards under L. Bernard Hall, he remained for upwards of six years. A year or so after leaving the schools, in 1912, having unsuccessfully competed for the travelling scholarship offered triennially by the trustees of the National Gallery, McInnes proceeded to Europe on his own account. He associated with no school during his two years' stay abroad, but devoted himself entirely to the study of landscape, his sketching tours taking him through England, Scotland, France, Spain, and later Morocco. Prior to his visit to Europe, Landscape had held but a secondary place in his attention, trained as he had been as a portrait painter. During his term abroad, however, McInnes's outlook underwent significant changes. From a soundly acquired, almost solid method of technique, there developed a freedom of handling which threatened, at one time, to become almost flaunting in its facility. So amazing was the apparent ease with which he dealt with the picturesque and hackneyed byways of the older world. This was due, no doubt, to the extraordinary amount of rapid note-taking 
in which, during these years, the artist indulged. But a knowledge of effects was gained in that period, an education in the habit of swift and accurate discernment in the value and possibilities of elimination so essential to the serious student of landscape. McInnes has the gift of colour. In an equal measure, he is the possessor of the instinct of selection. Not since the advent of Streeton has Victoria produced a landscapist in whom such peculiar directness of vision is revealed, or who has shown to quite such an effective degree the power of disregarding all but absolute essentials in the realisation of atmosphere and light. McInnes's work is generally characterised by a uniting tone of silver grey, which serves perchance to force some telling passage of contrasting sunlit distance. Whether he deals with effects of the big gum country, with men and oxen resting in cool shade, or with horses in ploughed fields beneath forms of wafting clouds, his colour is always harmonised and restrained, his atmosphere suggestively limpid, while light, gracious and all-pervading, is felt to invest even the least of his canvases. End of Part 2 This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 3 of The First Number of Art in Australia, 1916 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Julian Rossi Ashton by C. L. Jones Illustrated by The Crevice Oil painting in the possession of J. F. Archibald, Esquire. But only the master shall praise us, and only the master shall blame, and no one shall work for money, and no one shall work for fame, but each for the joy of the working, and each in his separate star shall draw the thing as he sees it, for the God of things as they are. Kipling Artist, teacher, prophet, no one man has had a greater influence on art in New South Wales than Julian Ashton. He is always to be found with the progressives. His influence has helped to form the minds of nearly all our notable artists. Lambert, Long, Gruner, Mahoney and others graduated from his studio. Julian Ashton is no mystic. He believes that a copper pot well painted is better than an archangel badly painted. He believes in painting the things as we see them. His art is stamped with sincerity. In the many years he has been working, it has passed through many phases, from the detailed late Victorian method to the broader and more temperamental ideas of the modern French school. English by birth, Australian by adoption, he has for many years been associated with all the best movements in art in this state. Julian Ashton, the man, is a familiar and genial figure to many of us. Lionel Lindsay once said of him, Much as I have always admired his characteristic art, I have always felt that the personality of Julian Ashton overtopped it. The first to uphold his belief and long-considered opinions, the first to recognise merit and encourage it, he has ever gone the way of his personality, directly, unswervingly, honestly a generous friend, a fine enemy. End of part three. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part four of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. John Sherlow by Lionel Lindsay Illustrated by The Slum, Bullen Lane, and Prince's Bridge, Melbourne. Etchings There is something Dutch about Melbourne. The river flats stretch to the bay in uninteresting and interminable vistas. Scarcely noticed, the salt-water junctions with the Yarra, 
from the unbroken horizon trees and buildings near at hand rise in characteristic nakedness and from almost any point of the compass the dome of the exhibition dominates the distance like a mosque there is nothing of romance or the picturesque in this landscape but there is character and of all the artists great and small that melbourne has produced i know of none that has penetrated this character so surely as john Sherlow. i believe that the fine merians from the seymour hyden collection in the melbourne national gallery made Sherlow an etcher just as surely as the great frenchman was inspired by the brilliantly bitten plates of the dutchman zeeman even in his earliest efforts Sherlow showed that he had mastered the theory of the bitten line and in the simplified drawing and insistence upon character in many of these wharf-side subjects he shows an insight into construction and a sense of the true direction of the line which is always a pleasure to dwell upon the enthusiasm that built his own printing press and engraved his rockers for mezzotint has never deserted him and he is as full of the joy of the craft as when he started in eighteen ninety five there is nothing deft about Sherlow's draughtsmanship he never plunges upon a happy chance trusting to luck for effect and his good taste has preserved him from that meaningless interminable play of the needle which gives the same quality to every object and which with an appearance of fluidity and cleverness can deceive only the unenlightened his work at its best is the result of careful and considerate selection and among his finest plates i would place the little prince's bridge the railway clock st mary's west melbourne eastern hill the bass solo and tyneside foundries the last named has ever been a favourite of mine of late Sherlow has been interested in the newer melbourne and has made two fine etchings of the fish market tower and the railway dome his tendencies today are towards romantic effects and chiaroscuro but it is to the etchings in his characteristic line that i turn with the greatest pleasure they are so honest and straightforward masculine statements simple and sincere in them he has exhibited his interests and his skill and has left melbourne his debtor for the record he has made of what has already passed and what is so swiftly passing away End of part four. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part five of the first number of Out in Australia, nineteen sixteen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Arthur Streeton by C. L. Jones Illustrated by Miller's Point, Sydney Harbour Oil painting in the possession of Leonard Dodds, Esquire, Sydney If art is nature, seen through a temperament, then Arthur Streeton's was the first distinctively Australian temperament to reveal this country in paint. Prior to Streeton, no one had seen its colour or realised the artistic value of its sunshine and atmosphere he was the first of australian artists to see what possibilities lay before the landscape painter as revealed by the modern french school a victorian by birth and an associate of tom roberts and conda he was quick to learn from these men and absorb all they had to show him of what the modern landscape painters were doing in the way of technique at that epoch-making exhibition held in melbourne about eighteen ninety two in which this famous trio exhibited he established himself in the minds of the public as an impressionist and an artist streeton has a european as well as an australian reputation in these days but it is not with his european work we are concerned it is the influence he has had on australian art this we believe speaking from a landscape point of view has been greater than that of any other australian artist streeton saw and painted the australian landscape with a sense of colour richness simplicity and poetry that had not before been equalled the painter 
of the purple noon's transparent light, the sun-baked hillsides, the shimmering breathless gums, the blue harbour under summer skies, has transformed the scenes of everyday nature, and given them a new beauty and a meaning to all who have eyes to see. End of part five. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 6 of the First Number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lure of Sydney by Howard Ashton. In Melbourne, there is little natural beauty, and the painters have to seek it. Some of them find it. Most of them despair of finding it out of doors and turn to figure painting. That is why the best of figure painters of Australia, with one or two exceptions, come from Melbourne. But there are landscape painters too. Streeton, David Davis and Withers were Melbourne men. These three learnt how to paint solidly, because it is not easy to make pretty pictures in Melbourne. One cannot go out and draw in a graceful distance and fill the foreground with cobalt blue, because there are hardly any graceful distances and no cobalt blue stretches of harbour water there. Around Melbourne there are stretches of rolling downs and a few straggling gum trees and ploughed fields and old cottages half hidden in garden trees. At the back of some of this landscape, if one is lucky, one may see the grey-blue ridge of the Dandenong Range. That is all that an hour's journey from Melbourne will give the artist, that or a stretch of flat beach and twisted grey-green tea-tree and greenish water on the shores of the bay. Hence the best of the Melbourne men have learnt to draw their foregrounds. But Sydney is a poem itself. It does not need the painter to show its beauty and romance. It does not need so much study to make a picture. The superficial charm is easy to reproduce. Streeton, from his work around Heidelberg, came up to the harbour and blossomed forth in gold and blue, but he had the solid study in Melbourne first, and he set all the young artists painting blue and gold, and many of them found it so easy, they gave up the study of values and of drawing and of textures and gave up truth too. Hilda painted blue and gold in watercolour, and rarely painted a foreground upon which one felt one could walk, but his romantic viewpoint touched what he did obtain with individuality, and so his pictures are valuable. Later on he discovered that all Sydney is not blue and gold, that there are greys and browns and quiet neutral tones as well. He did not paint foregrounds for people to walk on, he painted decorative arrangements, and his art was as true in intention as the material painters who must have reality. And now some of the young Sydney painters have discovered how easy it is to paint arrangements of Sydney, and a Hilda school has arisen. It is necessary to remember that the only person of a school who has a right to very much respect is the one who does not belong to it, but originates it or at least brings something new and vital into it. Every painter imitates in his youth, and looks back later to his imitations, with amusement, not untinged with shame. One finds that honesty and study are the two things without which no decent method of painting has ever been achieved, and that out of a man's own temperament he builds his working theory. A beautiful woman is a trap to foolish young men, and in them she invokes superficial passions based on nothing but externals. Sydney is a trap to young painters in the same way. How few of them have painted honestly the sandstone ramparts behind which she hides. Streeton, in his fires on, hinted at least that something could be made of them. Some of Hilda's clay pit studies hint, but only hints the same thing. How few of them painted her grey moods, her winter mists, her harbour evenings before the light has gone, 
her sand-hills and ocean beaches and harbour rocks and dried up patches of yellow-grey grass and twisted scrub there are thousands of sketches in blue and purple and gold of the harbour in sunlight and i have noticed in recent paintings of these a tendency to mere prettiness of colour the dull brown green of gum trees must be beautified with a little purple or pink the shadows are too dark and emphatic they must be toned down to be in harmony poetic license perhaps but one has to place scales before one can allow the inspiration of a great sonata full scope and play one has to paint values before one can play tricks with them and one has to paint greys before one can get the full effect of the blues and golds which they frame that is the trouble about sydney she inspires one to sonatas and forced tones before one has learnt scales and values End of part six This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 7 of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Norman Lindsay's Pen Drawings by Sidney Your Smith. Illustrated by two pen drawings. An illustration to the projected book of the poems of Villon and the spoilers in the possession of H. Hinton, Esquire, Sydney. No artist has carried pen work so far as Norman Lindsay. No tone problem has been too difficult for his pen. He has brushed aside the accepted limitations of the medium, and like all big men, he has broken traditions. He is important because he broke them successfully. Despite the fact that Charles Keane suggested innumerable tones with the pen and attempted more serious problems than Phil May, May's simpler method was regarded for many years as the correct expression of pen work. The great problem which has always interested Lindsay has been the rendering of tone with the pen. His earlier work had a decorative tendency, but was always masked in full rich tones. Later he disregarded the decorative massing of tones to a great extent and became interested in realism. The problem of light was dealt with and mastered. He learnt to make his distances recede. Has anyone suggested so well a wall with a flood of warm sunlight pouring on it, the cool shadows laid on with direct tones like watercolour washes? As Lindsay's work has developed, he has retained all the richness and depth of his earlier drawings, but he has obtained his effects with greater ease and with more direct work. It is only those who have attempted pen drawing who fully realise the great difficulties of the medium, and it is quite likely that only those people will understand the remarkable achievements of Lindsay in his later work. In pen work, a tone is made up of lines and its ultimate effect depends on the strength of the first lines put down. If they are wrong, one is forced to resort to cross-hatching, and much cross-hatching in a pen-drawing is a sign of bad judgment. It is because of Abbey's inability to determine the strength of a tone, and by his constant use of cross-hatching, that his work can never be considered great pen-work. A pen-draftsman must be deliberate, it does not do to hesitate in the middle of a piece of penwork any more than it does in laying on a wash in watercolour. The artist's mind must be made up. He must know exactly what he is going to do, and he must do it. One is down to essentials in pen drawing, and there is no method which shows one's weakness so readily. It is one thing to realise what is to be done, and quite another thing to do it. It is courageous to banish cross-hatching in a tone picture and try to get the same richness of effect without it. It is only an artist of Lindsay's ability who can successfully carry it out, for it means years of careful study and an immense knowledge and grip of his medium. The Villon composition in this book is one of Lindsay's recent drawings, 
and is carried out entirely with direct pen work. One can see that there is an entire lack of nervous hesitation. It is the finished work of a master hand which is sure. One feels that he possesses the complete mastery of the medium. Drawings simply flow from his pen. They look and are so easily done. He has a warm, sympathetic line, which is more suggestive than Vierge's, and more colourful. All his architectural details are put down gracefully, and very delicately. The pen in his hand is no longer a pen, for he uses it as freely as a pencil, and his pen drawings have softness of pencil work, while they retain the brilliance which is only obtainable with pen and ink. There is no doubt that important galleries and collectors abroad will some day endeavour to secure the finest examples of Lindsay's work. We look to our Australian galleries to retain the best drawings here, while the opportunity still exists. End of part 7。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 8 of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elliot Gruner by Howard Ashton. Illustrated by Frosty Morning. An oil painting in the possession of T.W. Heaney, Esquire, Sydney. Elliot Gruner is one of the few Australian artists of individuality who have found Australia good enough to live in. The fact that many of the others leave her is not at all to her credit. Mr. Gruner's present work demonstrates pretty conclusively that it is not necessary to go to Paris to learn to paint landscape. It is no doubt instructive to see how Constable and Turner used their glazes, but imitating other men's work never made for individuality, though it is valuable to a student in evolving a confident technique. There is only one way the honest and intelligent study of and affection for what one is painting. Mr. Gruner has taken that way. He was born in New Zealand of Norwegian-Irish parentage and began to study art in Julian Ashton's studio at the early age of ten, where I remember him as a small boy in knickerbockers and of very serious views. At fourteen he had to go to work in a draper's shop. Still, he kept his own soul, and went on working seriously at his painting. He came under many influences. The first hero, I remember, was a painter of no particular merit, named Jeffreys, who had a heavy, scumbling method, resembling Mr. Fred McCubbin's method of today. For a while, Gruner scumbled heavily. Then he escaped into a light, flat, decorative manner, which would not have led him very far but which was pleasing and interesting as far as it went. Passing under the Meldrum influence for a while, he came to a master of landscape, Corot, and for a year painted Corots. Then, in a fit of self-assertion, he finished up with imitations, probably for ever, and his latest work, of which the painting reproduced is an excellent example, is his own, and represents an honest love for his subjects, and a poetic outlook, which gives his canvases the valuable thing in art, individuality. His pictures are distinguished by good solid painting, and a fine rendering, in low tones, of the sunlight effects gained by painting towards the sun. To paint a furrowed field against the light is no easy problem, but Gruner has solved it satisfactorily in several late works. He obtains that feeling of a landscape, bathed in light, which is so often attempted and so rarely got. If one were inclined to criticise, one would observe that there are defects of every quality of temperament. Mr. Gruner will, perhaps, never paint a daring or spectacular landscape, but he will paint, and has painted pictures, which express a sincere and quiet appreciation of nature, and with which one can live happily and like the more one sees of them. End of part 8 
This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 9 of The First Number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Modern Malady by Norman Lindsay. I have noticed that three artists can hardly meet together nowadays without presently seeking to impose on one another the personal definition of an artistic creed. The procedure is not so much conversational as ritualistic. The confessional passion of the devotee, who must at all cost testify to the sanctity of his beliefs. While such conversational testimonies go no further than an intellectual exercise, no harm is done, but too often, behind them, one discerns the clanking chains of conviction, the effort to move fettered limbs in the prison-house of words. In plain truth, we have cast off a theological habit of belief without losing a theological habit of mind. We are as capable of calling a spade a sausage machine today as ever were the students of Duns Scotus. And though we can no longer enforce belief with the thumbscrew and the rack, we can still drive a journalistic pen into the vitals of an enemy's beliefs. Today the critic has replaced the priest, and as the priest by his ritualistic antics destroyed religion, so the critic, in the refinements of his virtuosity, has done a great deal to obscure the meaning of art. When one has ceased to discover, one sits down to tabulate the nature of one's discoveries. When one has ceased to create, one sits down to review the quality of one's creations. Criticism is the effect of sterility. Today the clamour of small artistic sects is a clamour for help. The uproar is the result of uncertainty, not of conviction. All issues are obscured by the wordy assertions of people without faith. We snatch right and left at definitions, as drowning people snatch at straws. God is no longer a problem to us, but there is still enough of priestcraft in our bones to make heresy a matter of the arts. One effect of this theological passion has led to an extraordinary jumbling of the common stock of artistic technicalities. The musician has discarded utterly the assumption that his business has merely to do with the production of harmonious sound. Like a pirate, he has invaded the domain of literature, and snatching the symbols of an alien craft, writes as a novel in a symphony, or a sonnet in crotchets and quavers. He has gone even further of late, and meddling with the artist's colour box, affects to teach our ears to see colour. The artist has not so much retaliated as assumed, too, the aspect of a technical brigand. Colour, form, tone, all the accepted problems of his craft, are discarded as things exploited and done with. He affects to translate the mechanism of movement, to express sensation, to tabulate in hasty paint the varying quality of emotion and even the passage of time. The truth is, this incompetent dauber has merely tried to substitute hieroglyphics of his own invention for the common alphabet by which we record the spoken word. He has done nothing more than resurrect the cuneiform tablet to express something that is more easily said in words. And if the truth must be told, the result is that of a savage experimenting with the art of writing. The relapse of the tired mind to primitive symbolism is a common phenomenon in all periods of low creative effort. Such backstairs revolutions as Cubism and Futurism and all the rest of the modern art movements are neither important nor significant. The best that can be said of them is that they are sometimes amusing, as a comic paper is amusing, and the worst, that there is so little accomplishment in their production that they are as dull as a child scribbling. Their only claim to significance is that they express the theological malady that has attacked the mind of all modern art, the same irritated desire to express a theory, to paint a conviction, is apparent in better and more serious efforts. 
the joy of work alone no longer suffices. We look with suspicion on any suggestion that we should associate gaiety with art, as though we were on oath to announce an ethical creed, instead of making it our business to express a joy in life. It seems to me that though a sincere effort to fix a standard of appreciation must be of value to the community, any effort to live up to an accepted standard is a danger to the artist. It clogs the creative sense to live with a schoolmaster at one's elbow. So few of us indeed have the courage of our dreams and desires, or make of work a festival for our own entertainment. If others enjoy it, so much the better. If they detest it, so much the better still. It is personal vision that counts in art, whether one is as intolerant as Nietzsche, or as kindly as Dickens. For the truth is, that all great art eludes a label. You can no more say that Dickens was a novelist, than that Shakespeare was a playwriter, that Rabelais was a satirist, or that Cervantes a storyteller. To call Rubens a decorator, is to miss seeing in his fecundity, the brutal fecundity of life. To call Rembrandt a portrait painter, is to see no mystery in the light that glows about his creations in paint. The small, uncreative mind is ill at ease outside the boundaries of a cult. It is lost without a label. The parrot cries of belief that we hear on all sides today are but the evidence of a feeble atheism. In fact, this seriousness of aspect is not the seriousness of work. The pretentious activity is a mask for idleness, and what is worse, boredom. A passionate and unending labour to acquire perfection of craft can only come from a passionate joy in work. That all great artists were great producers is the proof that they found in work a saturnalia of delight. Our hasty scrawls in paint are the evidence of a tragic disinterest. I see always the efforts of a bored and tired mind, seeking in work the stimulus of a drug. The modern novel is as shapeless as the modern picture. It sprawls from page to page, with the gabble of a man too tired to articulate clearly, or to choose his words with care. And the truth is that these wordy slabs of print are dull, because the writers are drearily defending a belief in art not a joy in life, and our acres of brightly daubed canvases are uninspired because the painters are vindicating a literary theory in paint, not a personal vision of form and colour. The melancholy conclusion is forced on one that most artists spend their life in doing work that has no personal significance to them whatever. They labour under the curse of an intellectual conviction I have known an artist in this desperate quandary throw over all he had acquired of dexterity and a profound sense of beauty, and exultantly proclaim a metaphysical creed that not only killed all charm in his work, but killed all power to work at all. The modern confusion of technicalities is the result of mixing metaphysics with the common necessities of a craft. Though art may be man's highest expression of passion and beauty, it is still tethered to the mechanism of his trade. Here at least is a fair subject for argument and dispute, but any subtler effort at the expression of an intellectual conviction is better left alone. For the artist is notoriously a man who lives within the limited range of his own personal vision. It is this narrowness of outlook that is his peculiar virtue, and peculiar vice, his savage and exclusive egotism, is of immense value as a stimulus, though maybe what it gains in virility, it loses in generosity. By intensifying his vision, it also narrows his vision. By looking only for needles in the hay, he often fails to see that hay too is beautiful. What I would plead for today and what I have been vaguely trying to arrive at in these remarks, is the wisdom of a little more light-heartedness, the wisdom, in fact, of occasionally having a lark with one's work. An effort is greatly simplified if one can remember in time to get rid of the burden of an intellectual conscience. 
gravity is more often only another name for dullness, and the truly serious works of art are those produced in a spirit of delight. Indeed, the emotion that produced Micorba inspired Giorgione's sleeping Venus, and the tragedy of Antony and Cleopatra is moved by the same thrill of exultation that created Panurge. End of part nine. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 10 of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hilda Exhibition by Bertram Stevens. Illustrated by Dora Creek. The last watercolour painted by J.J. J. Hilda. In the possession of Mrs. J.J. J. Hilda. The Loan Exhibition of Watercolours by the late J.J. J. Hilda. Held in Sydney in July last was a memorable event. Fellow artists who wished to do honour to Hilda collected over two hundred of his pictures from their owners and arranged them harmoniously in Julian Ashton's studio, where the public was invited to see them without charge. It was a fine tribute, the first of the kind in Australia, and one we may imagine that Hilda would appreciate. The exhibition was open for a fortnight, and was largely attended. Many of the visitors, no doubt, knew little of the technique of painting, but they saw beautiful effects and were delighted. Here were paintings of more or less familiar places, not as the ordinary person sees them, though doubtless as he would like to see them. Romance dwelt in these scenes, for Hilda put it there. He had it in abundance, and transmitted it through every stroke of his brush. Hilda's feeling for colour harmonies was unerring. Rich colours appeal to simple tastes, to youth and to primitive people. As man becomes more sophisticated, he thinks more of the fine intershades and neutral tints than of the riotous primaries. Hilda did not have time to become old, but he developed rapidly, and towards the end he tried to realise the subtler harmonies of grey and blue and green or the exquisitely vague lemon tints of the evening sky, more often than the strong colour of such a picture as his deviation. Some critics found the influence of Corot in Hilda's later work. He did not see the bent tree in the Melbourne Gallery until after he had found himself on the same path as the French master. The attitude of both to nature was identical, and in the young Australian, as in the greater Frenchman, there burned the genuine flame. Artists who knew the difficulty of Hilda's achievement were enthusiastic over the extent and variety of his work. When it was learned that the loan exhibition represented only half of what he had done in a period of less than ten years, with the handicap of steadily failing health, this concentration of his art within one room gave for the first time an idea of Hilda's versatility. A single picture may be sufficient to betray mastery, but it is necessary to know the breadth as well as the height of a man's work in order to estimate his value. Under the spell of so much beauty, and without means of comparison, I would not attempt to say where Hilda stands as a watercolourist. I could not help feeling, however, that it would be a very good thing for Australia if our national galleries were to form representative collections of our best artist paintings and keep them together on their walls. Imagine the permanent interest there would be in a panel of even twenty Hilders, comprising the best of each of his periods, and in similar panels of the best work of Streeton, Lambert, and other Australian artists. It is not too late to make them now. End of part 10 This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. 
Part 11 of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Florence Rodway by Bertram Stevens Illustrated by the Japanese screen Pastel in the possession of J. F. Archibald Esquire Miss Rodway, a Tasmanian by birth, had her first lessons in painting from Sid Long in Sydney. Afterwards, she attended the Hobart Technical School for a time. Then she went to London and joined the Royal Academy classes, where Sargent, Clausen, Storey and others overlooked the students' work. Figure and portrait painting in oil and black and white attracted her most, and on returning to Australia eight or nine years ago, she rented a studio in Sydney and challenged fortune as a portrait painter. Some of Miss Rodway's charcoal drawings of this period, designs for mural decorations embodying draped human figures, and some portrait heads in oil, showed considerable power, and no suggestion of feminine prettiness. There was, however, very little demand for work of this kind, and the studio rents had to be paid. Fortunately, a few studies of children in pastel, notably sleep, which was shown at the Society of Artists exhibition in 1909, attracted general attention. Soon commissions came in for portraits, mostly of children, and Miss Rodway has been fully occupied ever since. To obtain with coloured chalks a portrait that has character is not an easy task when the subject is a little child. Yet Miss Rodway has achieved as much success in such cases as she has with sitters offering features more distinctive. The portraits of Madame Melba, the two children of Henry Lawson, of Miss Coletti, and the one reproduced here, are artistic triumphs. There is also a charming study in green in the National Gallery, Sydney. Some day Miss Rodway hopes to break away from single figures and draw a more elaborate composition in pastel. During the last four years she has drawn about twenty portraits each year and has had no leisure for any other work. The streakiness in most of Miss Rodway's drawings was the result of a reaction from that smoothness of texture which to the pastelist often leads to artistic degradation. A judicious use of lines across the portrait and blending with the background gives a suggestion of depth and atmosphere. They put the head well back in the picture when viewed from the proper distance. Though Miss Rodway has handled these strokes effectively, she felt that they were liable to become an offensive mannerism and of late has adopted a simpler technique. The painting of miniatures has recently engaged Miss Rodway's attention and she promises to do as well on ivory as she has done with crayons. She has the gift of portraiture. She limbs her subjects with certainty and with grace. End of part 11「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Part 12 of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Norman Carter by Bertram Stevens. Illustrated by two studies for a mural decoration. Mural painting has received little encouragement in Australia. Our state and municipal authorities have not yet learned to think that a public building might possibly be a work of art as well as utility. If the outside does happen to have some beauty because of its simplicity, the interior, when it is not disfigured by builders' ornaments, is generally a drab nullity. Spaces which might have been used to gladden the eye while the ear is attending to the politician or the alderman are left as dead walls reflecting gloom. This is in keeping with the lack of interest in art, the bad architecture and the desecration of natural beauty such as Sydney Harbour, permitted or conducted by governments. A new spirit, however, is making itself felt, and there is hope now that the banalities of the past will not recur, 
and some may be removed in time. Though public bodies have not yet been affected by this aesthetic spirit, a few businessmen have recognised the advantage of decorating the interior wall spaces of their buildings. And, most hopeful sign of all, there are some people who appreciate the charm of a home in which every part is in harmony, and which has the note of individuality. In the painting of frescoes for houses, Norman Carter has already made a successful beginning. So far he has only received occasional commissions. No one has yet been able to devote himself continuously to this branch of art. Carter is one of the few who have had any training in decorative work. When a boy in Melbourne, he was employed by a firm of decorators, and was afterwards apprenticed to a maker of stained-glass windows. In the evenings he went to the National Gallery classes, and studied under Bernard Hall and F. McCubbin. The influence of the latter directed Carter to landscape painting, and for a year he painted in the open air, round about Q, his birthplace. Then his original preference for figure painting was confirmed, and he went back to town to study with E. Phillips Fox. Carter removed to Sydney in 1903, and exhibited his first big picture, The Cello Player, a portrait in oils of his brother, in 1905. Since then he has painted a good many portraits and figure studies. His most successful picture is a low-toned harmony, which was exhibited in Paris, and gained the Salon Medal. As a portrait painter, Norman Carter has attained a high place in Australia. He has followed well-established traditions, and painted with sincerity and unsparing pains. With favourable subjects, his solid handling has been very successful. For the last six or seven years, Carter has been trying to interest architects and others in mural decoration. His first commission was the painting of an overmantel panel, but the next meant thirty-two panels, figure and landscape, for Mr. G. F. Todman's residence at Homebush. Other commissions have followed, and the appeal of a distinctive scheme of decoration for the home seems to be reaching the people who can afford to have it. The first stage in the work of mural decoration is the careful consideration of the interior wall spaces and their relation to the doors and windows. Then a set of paintings on a small scale is made. It is from one of these miniature panels that the illustration here is reproduced. It does not do justice to the artist's scheme, which depends upon the combination of a number of similar panels in the room. To appreciate the charm of an artistically decorated room, one wants to enter the room itself. If a public building were treated in the same way, it could be seen and admired by many, and there would be then a better chance of private persons understanding how a home can be made beautiful and unique. End of part 12「ファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブ And the Edge of the World, Aquitaine. John Sherlow's etching of the sawmills inspired both Lionel Lindsay and Ernest Moppet with the desire to etch. That was in Melbourne twenty years ago. They studied P. G. Hamilton's book on etching in the Melbourne Library and at once made experiments in the art. Moppet etched landscapes and a few street scenes. while Lionel's first etchings were of pirates, very deeply bitten pirates, I am informed, for the action of nitric acid on copper was not yet understood. Lionel ceased etching until he went to London, where he produced two plates, Kipling's house and that of Henry James. These he did simply to show an American the process. He came to Sydney twenty years ago, and fascinated by the wealth of material in the rocks, 
He made numerous pencil studies, many of which he has since etched. He worked three or four years before exhibiting. He first showed his etchings with the Society of Artists in 1907, the exhibition at which Hilda made his debut. Lionel had no idea of making money with his etchings, and he marked all his prints at a very modest price. Arthur Streeton, who was in Sydney at the time, saw them, and was greatly taken with the quality of the work, and strongly advised Lindsay to raise his prices. The etchings were much admired, and a number of prints were bought. A little later in the year, when the Society had its exhibition in Melbourne, Lionel Lindsay scored a great success, seventy-five prints being sold there. As a matter of fact, before this time there had been very little interest taken in etching in Australia. Hop had produced some interesting plates in Sydney years ago, so had Julian Ashton, Fullwood, and two or three others. Hopkins was very interested in the art, and had tried hard to inspire others to do something with a beautiful medium, which he certainly did for a time. But nobody seemed able to keep up his enthusiasm. Sherlow has etched steadily for a long time, but the sales for etchings were never very large, and it is only comparatively lately that Sherlow's work has been fully appreciated. Lionel Lindsay created a revival and a new interest in the art in Australia. In the Society of Artists exhibition, Lionel's prints were mostly aquatints. The Edge of the World, reproduced in this book, is one of them, and is, I think, one of the finest aquatints etched in Australia. He looks on this plate as his mascot, as it was the first plate to sell right out. His interest in etching this plate was so great that he completed the whole of the biting in sixteen hours, working from 10 a.m. till 2 in the morning. There is a marked individuality in Lindsay's aquatints. He has always been attracted to romantic subjects, and his rendering of them is always interesting. There is a deep feeling of poetry in them that is always a rare quality. His work has not, perhaps, the academic polish of the English school, but when Lindsay talks, we are interested and want to listen. Another man may speak very nicely, but if he has no thoughts to express, our interest flags and we are bored. Lindsay's etchings never bore one. They are full of character and life. Excellently observed, dexterously needled and carefully bitten, his plates will remain as very valuable records. Lindsay displays a genuine feeling for antiquity in his old buildings, and his interest in character is expressed in his figures which have a Dickensian touch. He has produced a greater number of plates than any Australian etcher, over one hundred in all. His etchings are well known in Sydney and Melbourne, and his work has found a wide and appreciative audience. End of Part 13 End of the first number of Art in Australia, 1916「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.